Hi, the Vox. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. There's a lot of people in the room. Actually, I see that people started flooding to the staircases as well because it's so packed. No need to fact-check this if you're watching from home, it's true. Um, thank you for being here. I saw that the bar, I, I saw at the bar that glasses were already coming out, so thank you for being here and not at the bar. Whether or not that was the right decision from your part, I guess we'll see at the end. So, <laughs> joking aside, uh, this is 2022, a GitOps Odyssey, and during this talk, I will try to tell you a story about um, what we did as a company the last year and uh, years before that to transition from a traditional setup to a more cloud-native way of working. And so this is really our story. At some point during the presentation, I wasn't that creative, and I needed some material to fill my slides. So I did what anybody should do, and I turned to AI, and I asked AI to generate some pictures for me. Apparently, this is a presenter introducing himself to the audience during a tech conference. It, I think it's scary how far AI has come. However, I do hope that my hairline is in better shape than his. Um, that being said, who am I? Well, I'm Robin as you might have guessed from the introductory slide. And I'm a DevOps engineer or a platform engineer at Sofico, depending, depending on how you look at that role. What have, I, what have I been doing? Well, for the past few years, I have been building clusters as if they would have been for myself, rock solid and at the sharpest of prices. The last bullet point is a lie, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, maybe, maybe more importantly, uh, what's the Sofico, the company that I work for? Huh? Maybe a quick show of hands. Who in the audience owns a leasing car? Or well, I guess I can't use the term owns, but you drive a leasing car. <laughs> okay, a decent amount of people. To those people, I want to say, no problem. <laughs> we, do, we do our work with a smile. It's, it's no big deal at all. Uh, so what do we do as a company? Well, we empower other companies to provide superior mobility solutions. And this means that we are powering the world's biggest companies. This means that we have a lot of customers, over 60 clients, and I have over 400 colleagues that call Sofico their home. We have an international presence, uh, starting with offices in Belgium, the Netherlands, the UK, uh, Mexico, uh, Australia, and so on, but our customers are spread all over the world. This is our mission statement. I won't read it, but you can absorb it whichever way you like. I think I'll already be quite stressed uh, for time. But this, this, this concludes the marketing bit, right? Now uh, let's get down to some technicalities. Where did we start as a company? I think it's a pretty familiar site for most of you. We started with a monolithic product, right? Uh, an application that is to be deployed on a bare metal machine, a virtual machine at best, a traditional application server like a JBots on top of which we deploy a Java application. This is great, right? This, this functions absolutely fine, but it does pose us some challenges. Huh? For instance, how do we handle upgrades? Uh, does the application need to go down for an upgrade? Does the database need to restart for an upgrade? Things like that. And yeah, if during an upgrade something needs to go down, how do we handle service unavailability? Also, I think we, we all know this doesn't scale that well. How do you scale a monolithic application? Well, most of the time vertically. You throw more memory at it, you add more CPU cores. But this isn't the place where we want to be right now. So let's start and see how we can make this a bit better. So product evolution, let's move this thing to the cloud. The first thing that we did, and I think that most people will do, is let's containerize stuff, right? Let's put the stuff in a container, and then we can, we can run it everywhere where we can scale horizontally as well. We just add more containers into the mix instead of solely vertical. But this creates some new problems, right? How do we handle caching? We're moving from one server on one application server to multiple containers running on different nodes in a, in a distributed system. We need new caching methods. For instance, we introduced Redis. Also, the old, applica the old, the old application just used file storage. Yeah, we can't do that anymore, <laughs> the cloud-native way of working. So we have, we have to look at things like S3 compliant storage, stuff like that, things that are built from the ground up with the intention of being cloud-native. This could also pave the way for true blue-green upgrades where a service isn't unavailable for a certain amount of time. So 
This is a bit of a lift and shift operation on the existing application. Next to that, we are also developing a next generation platform developed from the ground up to be cloud native. And this is what we call our Miles microservices platform. And this is where you find all the interesting stuff, right? Advanced analytics, business intelligence. This is where the magic will be happening. It's, it's cloud native, as I said. It's highly available. Uh, things like continuous delivery get into play here. Now, a very, very important remark. This is not a replacement of the application that I showed you in the previous slide. And this sits on top of already existing application servers and enhances and extends the existing capabilities. And that means that it will pose some challenges later on. So our deployment strategy. First of all, I told you we work with big customers, and big customers often include financial institutions, and financial institutions are under heavy regulations. So sometimes they want to keep everything on their own premise, and we have to enable private cloud deployments. Then there is the other side of the spectrum, public cloud, where we deploy into a well-known public cloud vendor like Google, Azure, or um, AWS. And then there's the hybrid cloud strategy, because as, you told, as I told you before, we have an a legacy application that's most of the time deployed on premise, a next generation platform that sits on top of that, and then we get hybrid situations. Customers want to host their own legacy set of applications, and we, then we spin up a next generation platform in a public cloud provider, for instance. Three different deployment strategies, and they all have their own challenges that we have to face. So, what challenges are we looking at? First of all, software as a service isn't always possible. Don't, don't get me wrong. SaaS is a major part of our strategic vision, and we are working on it. But sometimes a customer doesn't just want to trust you with their entire infrastructure, and it's not feasible. So challenge one. Challenge two, each and every customer, I think you all know this, has their own unique demands and sets of wishes that you have to cater to. Then there's a, a distinct difference between us hosting something as a company and trying to do our best to make that as good as possible, and the customer deploying their product, our product on their own premises. This means that we want to remain cloud agnostic, right? I told you before, we support private cloud, we support public cloud, and also the hybrid model. So we really need a thorough agnostic approach. Then, we don't want any vendor lock-in. I think everybody hates vendor lock-in, so let's avoid that. And on top of that, the platform itself isn't that easy as well, right? There's, there's an embedded API gateway running in there. There is stuff like Keyclock, Kafka, all the good stuff. But we need to keep that manageable, of course. So the first thing that we did to alleviate some pressure is we opted to choose for a very good target environment, a cloud platform that already does some of the work for us and makes our life easier. So we said, well, we'll only target certified Kubernetes environments, right? We target the basic set of Kubernetes APIs. Each certified environment supports those. And then it shouldn't really matter whether a customer is hosting our oopsies. That was not the intention. What the hell? I think I'm out of range. <laughs> then it shouldn't matter whether or not the customer is deploying on something like AKS, EKS, Pivotal, OpenStack, whatever you like. At Sofico's side, we made the decision to focus on Azure, right? We deploy in AKS using a hub-spoke method. We, we, do, we do Terraform. We run multiple namespaces per cluster because we want to enable multi-tenancy on a cluster level. So that's great. Uh, this is my job, apparently. I often also stare at things all day long. So I think AI, once again, did a pretty good job in depicting this. So in order to tell our story about our GitOps deployment strategy, because as you would have guessed from the title of this presentation, it's about GitOps, I shall first explain some base tools which we need to understand thoroughly before we can move on. Now, the first one is Helm. I do think that most of you already know Helm, but I'll just assume that the audience is quite diverse, and we just go over the basics just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I did what I do best, and I turned to Google. It's 90% of my job, basically. And I asked Google, what is a Helm? And Google told me, well, help. Helm helps you manage Kubernetes applications. That's great. That's the thing I want to do. I want to manage Kubernetes applications. In fact, Helm charts help you define, install, and upgrade even the most complex Kubernetes application. Amazing, I think this is just the tool that we need. So a lot of terminology in here. Let's delve a bit deeper. Uh, there's a little glossary. Let's have a look at what that statement actually means. 
So first of all, there's a concept called a Helm chart. And a Helm chart is a bundle infor of information that you need to deploy a certain application onto Kubernetes. In essence, this comes down to a lot of templating, or a lot of template files that the engine will take care of. The cool thing about Helm charts is that just like Docker containers, you can pack them up and send them to a registry and you can share them with other people. This means that for most of the shelf applications, there's already a Helm chart available that you just can fetch and you can install on your Kubernetes cluster uh, within yeah, minutes, seconds, uh, <laughs> depending on what application it is. Then there's configuration, right? A configuration is configuration information for that specific application, your use case, that you want to merge into this base Helm chart bundle of information. So this is where we add our own flavor, as to say. Eh? And then we have the combination of a chart with its configuration running in our Kubernetes cluster, and that's what we call a Helm release. So with that being said, let's do a Helm speed run very quickly. So first of all, I add the Helm repository where the chart is located at. Then I can fetch the Helm chart from that repository as I would do with something like a Docker container. In this case, I opted for PG admin. This gives me a tarball. This tarball you can extract whichever way you like. And that's a folder. And inside that folder is my Helm chart. This is the information that I need to construct the application. Let's have a quick look at what's actually in there. Oh, I, was, I was a bit slow. OK, this is, this is templating language, right? Very important, this is not plain YAML. Helm operates through a templating language. And that's, that's a key thing to remember. And this is the config file. So here is the default configuration of the application. I grab a piece of config, and I start to create my own config file, right? Because I want to merge my specifics with a base set of information. So I copy this line. It's Vim. I can't really use Vim. It's a bit slow. All right. Let's save that, and then let's actually also change it because it was just the same thing. So I want two replicas. I want my application to run with two replicas, and then I just issue a Helm install. I want to install pgadmin using the chart I downloaded, using my values file, and Helm will interact with my cluster to get it up and running. So let's do just that, and I get the response that my application has been deployed. I look at my pods, and indeed, I see two pgadmin pods running. Great. Let's change the configuration. Let's move to five replicas and do the same thing. The only thing is we can do an install now because it's already running. We'll do an upgrade. So we let Helm upgrade our replication. OK, we're done. Let's check. And indeed, now I see five pods. So I just interacted through a config file. I didn't really cut to Kubernetes at any point. But yet, I was able to get my application running. And that's both a major pro, right? You, you don't need to know a lot about Kubernetes to get your application running. But it's also a bit of a con, right? Because you are losing the direct control over your Kubernetes API. You're not really sure what's happening behind the scene. You're just changing a config file. And often, these config files start to look like this. All kinds of buttons and levers that you can press and pull. You might not really know what they do, but they're there. And trust me, just like in real life, the AZ3 button doesn't always work. On top of that, there's also another remark I want to make, and that's a remark about CRDs, eh? custom resource definitions. What are those? I guess most of you know, but just to get on the same uh, wavelength, customizations are extensions of the basic Kubernetes API. Right? Kubernetes ships with a bunch of basic APIs, pods, deployments, services, all of that good stuff. But actually, in reality, we can tell Kubernetes to also serve other, other objects. Right? And to do so, we need to define a definition of the custom resource that we want to talk about with Kubernetes. So we are extending the API. And Kubernetes is not only a cloud or a, or a container orchestration platform, no. It's also a set of APIs, and perhaps that's even the most, that is even the strongest asset of Kubernetes. And Helm doesn't handle these very nice. Helm will install your CRDs when you do a Helm install, but it won't upgrade them. Because just like your application, these APIs are versioned. And why doesn't Helm do that? Well, because deleting all the API versions often results in data loss, because you also lose the objects associated with the definition. Eh, you, that's a dangerous domain to tread in. Uh, my grandfather always said three things are certain in life, a death, taxes, and a whole lot of trouble when trying to upgrade CRDs. 
That's a joke. My, my grandfather only uses Fargate. Um, <laughs> let's, let's continue. I digress. Um, oh, great. Technical difficulties. A second tool, <laughs> customize. Uh, what is customize? Once again, I turned to Google, and Google told me, well, customize. Customize reverses a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes manifest to add, remove, or update configuration options without forking. Already a big distinction with the previous tool, right? Here we are talking about plain Kubernetes manifests. No templating language in between. It's a purely declarative approach to configuration customization. And every artifact that Customize uses is plain YAML and can be validated and processed as such. What do we use it for? It allows us to compose things. It allows us to compose different resources together, and we can, we can uh, add overlays on top of those compositions. A very important concept within Customize that will return later on in the presentation is a base. Uh, what is a base? A base is a set of resources that are referenced by a customization.yaml file, and they can be used in multiple overlays. Concrete example. I created a base called My Web App. This is just a folder on my operating system, and in there I have some YAML files. I have a deployment, just your basic deployment manifest, nothing fancy. I have a service that exposes my deployment, and I have a customization file that references those two uh, resources. I've created a very simple base. Now, let's create an overlay on top of that base. What are overlays? Well, they are all about merging. They are about merging new configuration properties into your base. I create an overlay. Once again, just a folder. In that folder, there's a configuration change for my deployment. For instance, in development, I only want to run one replica. And on my service, I want to expose a second port. I don't know why you would want to do this, but I just want to make a message, right? It's not supposed to be anything at all. And then, I define a new customization.yaml file that says, well, this deployment um, file apply to all deployments that you see. And this service file apply it to all services that you see if they have a certain label. And on top of that, I also tell, I also tell Customize to add a common label, type equals dev, to all resources. Once again, I have a quick speed run for you. So let's have a look at what Customize looks like. So, I'm inside a folder on my operating system. Actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have gone for black and blue. But <laughs> there's a base and there's an overlay folder. Two bases, my web app and your web app, and an overlay called dev. In this folder, there's a customization.yaml file. Let's start and edit that one, and let's start by composing. So I tell Customize, hey, I want to include two resources. I want my web application, and I want your web application. Let's wait for the me of yesterday to get done with typing. All right, we made our composition, and now we tell Customize build this stuff. So we do kube control customize of the current directory, and out comes our, 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 um, our resources. So two deployments, two services, as we expect, and then we add an overlay on top of that. So we add a new component, and we say, hey, this component is our dev overlay. Okay. Let's save that. Let's run that same command. And now, as you can see, a label type dev has been added, and an extra port has been exposed on my service, and the deployments are running with one replica. So it did what we expected to do, and that's great. Um, so the main distinction with Helm is no config file, no templating engine. You are truly touching the plain Kubernetes manifests, and you don't lose track of the thing that you're actually doing on the Kubernetes API. So, before we start with how we combine this with GitOps, let's actually talk about what we see as a good deployment. What are our deployment expectations? Well, first of all, I think it has to be easy. I have to do this every day. I'm not that smart, so it has to be easy. It has to be automated. I don't like to do tedious work, so please, for the love of God, automate it. But an automated process that just does something uh, is, is, is scary. So you want a secure process. And as part of the secure process, we want to make sure that it is auditable, right? You want it to be flexible. You want to roll forward. We want to roll backwards, all within the blink of an eye. And we want to capture that feedback near instantaneously. And then on top of that, we want the deployment to be resilient. 
right? We are working in a distributed system, dangerous lurking behind every corner. One might even say that the base state is failure. So our application must 100% be resilient to change and to unforeseen circumstances. There is no happy path. Okay, introducing GitOps. This is a slide with a silver bullet. Do I believe that the silver bullet exists? Well, not really, but I wanted the video game reference. So there it is. <laughs> um, although, to be honest, I do think that GitOps checks some of the boxes that we discussed in our expectations. It's about taking tools that you already know and that are quite common within the development context. For instance, Git, as the name implies, and also starting to use them in the realm of infrastructure. This is not just infrastructure as, infrastructure as code with uh, a version control on top. It actually calls for a fully curated landscape of tools that support this methodology. So it might seem easy at first, but in reality, it's a bit more complex. All right, let's lay down some foundations of what comprises GitOps. Well, first of all, everything is declarative. Uh, so we are using infrastructure as code, and everything is contained in a Git repository. This is our single source of truth. Declarative is key here. We are no longer interested in specific control flows. We, we, don't, we don't issue single steps anymore. We have a, like, we have a declarative uh, file, and this will become later on, that, that, that tells us what the end state should look like, and we want the process to take us there in a reproducible way. So, pillar one, declarative. Pillar two, automation. I don't want to SSH into a machine and start bashing away at my keyboard, writing some bash scripts to get my deployment up and running. No, everything should be automated. Then lastly, auditable. The entire process should be auditable. The commit trial of your Git repo does not only serve as an audit lock, who did what and who approved those changes, but also as a transaction lock. Each and every commit on that repo represents the state of your cluster at that point in time. I don't know if you read the book, The Phoenix Project. It's a, it's a good book. If you didn't read it, go read it. And in that book, there's a, there's a character called Brent. And Brent is the guy that fixes everything, right? So if there's a problem in production, he will SSH onto your machine, he'll write some, he writes some scripts, and stuff will start working again. But the thing is, persons like Brent have a lot of work to do, and most of the time their changes aren't documented, and nobody knows what they really did. So imagine if all those changes were in Git from the beginning, yeah, then you wouldn't have this issue, because you have your transaction log showing you exactly what happened. So let's move on. How do we take this and apply it with the things that we saw before? May, first, a quote. You need some buzzwords from time to time. This is a quote by Kelsey Hightower. He's an engineer at Google. And he said, GitOps is version CI-CD on top of declarative infrastructure. It's all about stopping scripting and starting shipping, right? So we want to shift from writing scripts to the things that actually matter, shipping new functionality to our customers and production. So, the main way we enable this at Sofico is by leveraging, by leveraging a tool called Flexity. We didn't develop anything. We didn't develop any of this stuff. This was created by Weaveworks. You can check it out. And what does it do? Well, it takes the things that I told you about earlier, and it adds some Kubernetes magic to it. Right? So we have Helm and Customize. We have our Kubernetes magic, and we sprinkle some controllers on top of it. But in order to understand this, I must first explain what is a control loop, right? because that's the magic that's at the heart of Kubernetes. So let's have a look. This is a, a wise musician schooled in the ways of Kubernetes. What is this magic? Well, it's actually very simple. We, we observe an actual state, what's currently running in my cluster, and we, we observe a uh, desired state. What's in my Git repo, where I want the cluster to go. And then we start a reconciliation process. We look at the actual state, we look at the desired state, and we reconcile those. The process is very easy. We observe, and if we spot the difference, yeah, then we act. And we take a meaningful decision at that point in time to make sure that we bridge the gap that we just observed. And we just keep repeating that process. <laughs> there is, that, that's, that's all there is to it. We observe the actual state, we check for our difference from the desired situation, and we act upon that difference. We make a meaningful decision. And that's what Flux does, right? And this also, this also is a new way uh, of thinking, maybe, of working, because old CI CD might have looked a little something like this. The user commits something into Git, 
that commit files of a trigger to your CI or, or CD system, Jenkins, for instance. And then Jenkins takes that content and pushes onto your cluster, right? so a push mechanism. However, I want to pose the question, what happens when, in the tall grass, a wild junior engineer appears and suddenly something gets deleted? Intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't really matter, it's gone. Well, I think that in this case, nothing happens. Because the trigger will only get fired a second time if a new commit takes place, but there isn't happen th nothing is happening here. So, what would the situation look like when using a reconciliation mechanism like Flux CD? Well, the start is just the same. We commit something into Git, but then there is no trigger. No, Flux is actively reconciling the state in your Git repository and adjusting the cluster to reflect that state. So, the same thing happens. Something gets deleted. Well, now it's just a matter of time until the reconciliation process notices that your desired state has drifted away from your actual state, and we will take a meaningful, um, we will make it, we will take a meaningful decision to adjust this. Uh, we will correct configuration drift. So, how do we do this? Well, we do this by creating controllers. Is it already set? Kubernetes has a lot of controllers by default, managing your deployments. Uh, the managing uh, all kinds of stuff, but we take the things that we saw earlier, customize and helm, and we wrap them inside a controller. So a controller means that we need those custom resource definitions because the controller needs a Kubernetes object to look at and to start using that control loop, that reconciliation mechanism. So let's have a look. We will first of all provide an abstraction for a helm chart. So as you can see at the top, this is not the default API version, it's a Flux-specific API version, and it's a Helm release. This represents us installing a Helm chart onto our cluster. I can give it the target namespace that I want to deploy to, I can give it an interval at how many times it should pull, and then I give it the chart information, just like, it, like, just like I did before. I tell it, hey, use the Prometheus stack chart at that version. I give it a reference to where it can actually find that chart, and then I can also Tell it to handle my CRDs for me. So remember, Helm by default doesn't manage CRDs. Flux does. I can tell Flux, well, on upgrade, create new CRDs and replace, you know, replace unused ones. And that's already some pressure off my shoulders and stuff that's being done by Flux. And then at the bottom, I specify my configuration, right? I used to do that in a values.yaml file. Now it's just part of the declarative object. So the steps that I did earlier, fetching a Helm chart, unpacking it, changing the config, installing it on the cluster. We have abstracted that behavior onto a single object that, our Kubernetes, that the Kubernetes API knows about and can work with. We will do the same thing for a customization. So once again, it's a CRD. It's something that we added to the API. Once again, I specify a target namespace. I give it an interval. It can also do value replacement, which is pretty nice because remember, customize is purely declarative. There's no templating, but variable substitution, yeah, it's quite easy because components are more reusable that way. So just know I can do variable substitution as well. And then I give it a reference. I tell customize, hey, look at this Git repository, go to that path, and then generate the manifests that you want to apply to the cluster and make it happen. And a Git repository is also CRD. It's, a, it's an SSH URL in this case with a specific tag or branch. So it's about taking things that we already know and extracting them into Kubernetes objects that these controllers can work their magic on. So, oh yeah, there's also a prune directive. Not that important. You can tell customize, hey, if something disappeared uh, between the actual state and the desired state, delete it or I'm not sure, don't delete anything, don't prune, um, but not that important here. So let's start and talk about actually building clusters using this mechanism. So at first there was nothing, and then an engineer said, maybe we should start using Terraform for this. Um, I'm not sure if you are acquainted with Terraform. Terraform takes your cloud APIs and codifies them into declarative uh, configuration files. Once again, Declarative, it shouldn't really surprise you anymore. So if you want to build a cluster, then the first thing we need is, of course, a cluster. We need infrastructure to deploy upon. So we tell Terraform, hey, give us infrastructure. In our case, give us an AKS cluster. OK, that's great. The infrastructure is there. Then we can start the second part. 
we can start bootstrapping this stuff. How do we do that? Well, we do a Helm install through Terraform of Flux. Uh, Flux will install a few things. Flux installs more things than the things that I'm currently showing you, but they wouldn't fit on my slide, and it's not about getting the technicalities exactly right, it's just about conveying a certain message to you. So if you use Flux and you feel like this isn't the entire story, yeah, maybe it isn't. Um, but mainly we have two controllers, a customized controller and a Helm controller, and I introduce a bootstrap customization object into that uh, cluster as well. The customized controller is doing a watch loop and it will notice this customization object being created. And it will check the desired state of that object and it will make my actual state represent that desired state. So in this case, the desired state is to spawn more customization objects because customize is just plain Kubernetes YAML, so of course it can generate itself, right? We just generate more customizes from that, uh, initially, from that, from that initial customization. And those to customization objects are also noticed by the controller, and the controller looks at, okay, what do you want me to deploy? Well, in this case, we want to deploy a Helm release. We want to deploy Prometheus, and we want to deploy a Kafka operator. The foundations and the platform thing uh, will come back later. And then the Helm controller will notice these Helm release objects, and it will start uh, representing their desired state. So in this case, I want to do a Helm installation of Prometheus, I want to do a Helm installation of Kafka, and voila, we see the actual Kubernetes resources appear. That's for the foundations, for the platform. How does this look for an application? Uh, because I told you, we do multi-tenancy, multiple teams are working within the same cluster, so let's go through this flow once more, but now from the outlook of an application. So. I have a cluster, not to scale, and in that cluster, once again, I introduce a customized controller and I, int I introduce a customization called Bootstrap. This is all happening in some namespace, doesn't really matter which namespace, in this case it's the foundations namespace of my cluster. Okay, and the controller will, we will do the same thing again. So you have a customization, let's see what it actually wants. Well, first of all, we want to start by creating two new namespaces for our teams that they can deploy their application into. And in those namespaces, we will also uh, deploy a Helm controller. Um, you could also use one single Helm controller, reconciling everything, but we found it easier to scale horizontally by restricting Helm controllers to only work within their, same, within their own namespace, and then we just deploy one into each namespace that takes care of that namespace. Okay. That's the first thing that I want to do, but next to that, I also want to introduce, once again, new customization objects, right? It's a bootstrapping procedure. We want a customization object for team two, a customization object for team one, and that customization object will also get picked up by the controller, and we will start spitting out new resources. In this case, Helm releases, right? Team one wants to uh, deploy an application and some kind of portal. Team two wants to do the same thing, slightly different names, okay. The Helm controller in their respective namespace will pick up these objects and will start spitting out the actual Kubernetes objects associated with installing that Helm chart. That's great, right? Two teams working within the same cluster, their configuration is in Git, they can work independently of each other and customize just pointing at that Git repo and making sure that whatever is codified in there becomes a reality within the cluster. I told you that we use things called a foundation layer and a platform layer, and these are components that we define once in Git, but that we then deploy on all clusters, or well, on most of the clusters that we serve, right? It's defined once, so general components, we define them once, we deploy them on all clusters. And that's the great thing, right? You, you make your definition once in Git, and then you just point different fluxes at the definition, and they will start reconciling the thing. So, things like monitoring, Prometheus is something that we want to install on, our, on all our clusters. We've got a base for that. We, we deploy it everywhere. Networking, external DNS goes into all clusters. Security, open API gatekeeper, uh, good stuff like that. There's also a platform component. Oh, well, no. First of all, we have no hard opinions <laughs> because I said before, bases are agnostic, right? No vendor lock-in, um, no tailoring to specific cloud providers. And if you, want make, if you want to make something specific, we add overlays that merge specific configuration, ob specific configuration properties into that base. So for instance, this is a whole lot of YAML. 
but it just represents the external DNS Helm chart that I want to uh, install on my cluster. There are just the default things in here, resources, pull secrets, uh, namespaces, registries, stuff that's the same regardless of what cluster we deploy on. So that's the base, and then when I want to add um, specific configuration, for instance, I want to deploy this on Azure, well, I create an overlay, and this overlay starts filling in the Azure-specific properties, right? It has to communicate with a resource group, a tenant ID, a subscription ID. I want to set the provider to Azure Private DNS. I want specific pod labels. All the stuff like that goes into an overlay. Next to the foundations part, we deploy a platform as well. This is more application-based. Not all clusters need um, this platform component. But turning it, off and, turning it off and on is just as easy as whether or not we introduce that customization object that references the Git repo. So once again, we define these components once. Uh, it's, it's all about data platform. For instance, we use um, the Streams, the Kafka operator. We use Postgres. It's a fun fact. Most of you probably order shoes at Zalando. We use uh, Zalando-based software to run Postgres. You can, you can Google that. They, they, they create an actual Postgres uh, operator. And we deploy this on demand, whether or not that specific cluster needs this data platform. So what does this look like for applications? Because, OK, a foundations layer, a platform layer, that's easy, right? Those remain the same amongst different clusters, but applications change, right? I told you at the beginning, one of the main challenges that we face is unique customer demands. So how do we build an application? Well, once again, as, as, as everything, we start by selecting bases. For instance, a certain customer wants a bike service, a car service, and a driver web portal. This doesn't, real, this doesn't really mean anything. Just know that we select bases. And these bases can be reused by different customers. Because once again, bases are agnostic, overlays are specific. And then we merge the configuration specific, that for, specific, specific, uh, specific for that customer into those bases. Eh? For instance, this customer requires a configuration for the car service and the bike service. That's not standard. It's uniquely tailored to that customer. And then we grab that and we combine that into what we call a flavor. And a flavor is really a customer-specific version bundle of microservices and some customer-specific configuration applied on top of that. We define this in Git. This is stored in a Git repo. And then we can start to work all kinds of magic. So let's have a look. How do I deploy this? Well, I start from Git. Team one has created a flavor. That flavor is in Git. And then I can say, well, let's take a certain branch or a certain tag of that flavor, and that I want to deploy to my dev cluster. OK, development process goes along quite nicely. I want to deploy something onto a test cluster. So I just take that, game, that, that Git repo. I create a new branch or a new tag called test. And that automatically gets deployed onto my test cluster. You can do the same thing for integration if you want to layer some additional integration tests. But this is quite cool, right? Because just by promoting code from one branch to another, you can actually dictate where it will be deployed. And that's great. That's the awesome thing about GitOps. Just by changing some branches, by changing some tags, we can roll forward, we can roll backward. Because remember, every Git commit is a transaction log. It, rep it, re it represents the desired state at that point in time. And then, once we're through this entire process, uh, we went to development, we did some tests, the integration tests went fine. Yeah, then we can package this thing and we can ship it to the, to the customer. And then the customer just gets a repo with a certain tag applied to it. And on their side, upgrading their application, if they wish, that, if they wish, excuse me, if they wish to do it themselves, is just as easy as changing a Git tag in their configuration repo. So let's now circle back to the thing that I showed you earlier, our deployment expectations. And let's see if we actually met our goal, right? Um, is this easy? I'll be honest with you. It's difficult. <laughs> it depends. I think from the, customer's from the customer perspective, this is easy, right? They get the version bundle from us. And upgrading is just as easy as changing a tag. However, on our side, there is a lot of configuration that we have to do. I think that's evident, right? We have to create a lot of bases. We have to create a lot of overlays. But the cool thing is you only have to do this once. You define this once, and then you can take it everywhere. So that's why on easy orange check mark depends on how you look at it. 
Personally, I think it's great. Other people might have a slightly different opinion. Is it automated? Yeah, of course it is, right? I didn't do anything here. The only thing that I did I was, was I introduced a customization object through Terraform into my cluster, and then the entire process starts bootstrapping itself. Of course, given that your configuration is present in Git and has been done beforehand, but the process itself, yeah, that's fully automated. I think that's evident. Is it secure? Yeah, I think it's secure, because Flux is taking care of everything. This means that I can actually start about restricting cluster access for other people, because Git is my source of truth, so I don't really need engineers or developers to connect to my cluster and to start toying around, because the state should be described in Git. You shouldn't toy around with kube control yourself. On top of that, you can restrict the access to form flux as much as you like, and to make sure that it doesn't change anything that you want to be changed. For instance, multiple customers of ours run Flux in a minimal setup where it can't do that much. It can just do enough to get the application up and running. Is it auditable? Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> By design, right? It's, it's, it's GitOps. You have the Git commit trail that serves as your audit lock. At every point in time, you can see who authored the change, and if the change was merged into production, into your master branch or something like that, you can see who voted for that change to get merged. Uh, also, to circle back to the security thing, remember this is GitOps, everything is done in Git, so this means that you can automatically deploy tests and all that good stuff on top of these changes to make sure that the changes are actually fit for production. So by its very nature, I think it's both secure and auditable, and it's flexible, because as I showed you, deciding on which cluster something gets deployed is just as easy as toying around with your Git branches and Git tags allowing for rapid deployment, right? And is it resilient? Yes, it is, because by its very nature, this thing does repair cluster drift. By the reconciliation process, we can make sure that our actual cluster state doesn't drift from the desired state codified in our Git repo. So, with all of these things in mind, maybe we should think about not calling this a deployment expectation, but the deployment reality. And that concludes the journey I wanted uh, to take you on during this session. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And this is just my generic ending slide. So <laughs> thank you. I, I don't know if Q&A is a thing, but I think we have some time left. So if anybody has questions, please ask them, and I'll try to respond to them. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But there are multiple versions actually running that on the cluster and you're assigning that. Yeah. Does it make it not a single source of truth anymore, right? So your question is, uh, we, we you have an application and some kind of automated test gets ran against that application and it doesn't meet the test criteria, so it can't move on to production. Um, but there are multiple versions of that application running. So uh, Git isn't, I'm not sure. <laughs> like when running, uh, a, 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 uh, sorry, a rolling upgrade. Yes, a rolling upgrade, sure. Yeah, so, and uh, the new version. Yeah. Doesn't really meet every requirement yet. OK. Yeah. Well, so the, 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 there is a chance that multiple versions are deployed at the same time. Uh, that's true. But what we do is we make uh, we, we define our applications in such a way that if they, for instance, if they require a major upgrade, they are versioned differently and they can be deployed together inside the, in the inside the same namespace. They won't introduce resource conflicts or anything like that. Uh, when a new major version gets created, it should be able to coexist with the previous major version. So they should be able to be tested independently of each other. Although, in reality, I'm not a developer. I'm not sure how true that statement is. 
but they should be able to coexist into a single cluster, and everything should always be described in Git. Um, does it mean you can drift? Yeah, sure. Somebody can always go and, and change things, uh, but they shouldn't. I don't know <laughs> if I'm answering your question. Um, but come to me afterwards, maybe, <laughs> because I, <laughs> I don't know if there's uh, somebody else that wants to ask something. Yes? Um, you state that you have a secure solution. Yes. Yes. Ah, great question. I was hoping on that question from the very beginning. So if everything is in Git and Git is your single source of truth, then how do you manage secrets? Uh, there are multiple ways to manage secrets, right? The, the platform uh, doesn't have an opinion. Uh, you can leverage a key vault in Azure, for instance. There are specific operators. Uh, well, there is one really, for instance, the external secrets operator and you define a CRD inside of your Kubernetes cluster, you point it towards that uh, AKS key vault, HashiCorp vault, whatever you want, and you tell it, hey, take this configuration and synchronize it into a Kubernetes secret. So no secrets in Git, just a CRD that tells you connect to that key vault and synchronize secrets. That's one thing to do, right? But that implies that you have a key vault. If you have no key vault, there's also an alternative solution, and this is the thing that we propose to our own customers. And that is, uh, there's a, a project by Bitnami called Sealed Secrets. And what it does, it's, it, it, it installs a pod inside your cluster. You give that pod a key and a certificate, and you ask it to encrypt secrets. So you can run kubeseal, that's the, that's the CLI thingy that's associated with it. You take kubeseal and you ask kubeseal, hey, given this certificate and this key, please encrypt my secret. And then it spits out a sealed secret to you. And this is an encrypted resource that you can add to your repo. And then the operator inside the cluster will unpack that sealed secret and will create the associated secret. So that's how we do it if no key vault is available. And then secrets are in Git and they are not readable. <laughs> so th thank you. Did you have anything in mind asking the question? Or <laughs> ah, OK. Thank you, thank you. If you want to know more, please, please visit. Anybody else? I can't see any hands, but then again, the lights are blinding me also, so... Yeah, ah, sure. Question, huh? So you talked about uh, multi-tenancy yes. SaaS application. Yes. So uh, when you said about flavoring for different yes. customers, do you port the application source code for the different customers, or everything gets treated by a configuration? Okay, so we, do we... Because I, I talked about multi-tenancy, and flavors reuse the same components. So the question is, uh, do we fork the application source code uh, to deliver to multiple cluster, uh, to multiple customers? Uh, first of all, when I talk about SaaS, I want to make clear that if we provide a production solution, there will be no multi-tenancy. If it's production, it's one customer, one cluster. Um, however, when it comes to actually delivering an application or a flavor to a customer, there is a very thorough CI process that just copies the basis and the flavors that that customer needs and packages it to that customer. There's no forking process or anything like that happening because all the source code is contained uh, within container images. So we just ship container images and they have a certain, uh, certain functionality and then we ship the Helm charts that do the Kubernetes flux, the fluff around that. There's no forking or anything like that happening in there. So, so if there is a customer feature required which goes outside your standard product? Yes. Well, Would the code be still inside your standard product for that customer, or does it remain outside the core product? Outside? Well, if a, so, so your question is, if a customer has a specific need that's not part of your core component, how do we, ha how do we tackle this? Well, if a customer has a specific need, then we just develop a separate microservice for them, and we, uh, we add that to the flavor as a customer-specific thing. Because the thing that I didn't tell you, uh, but there's also, there's also a, a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. You have bases that are general for everybody. But if a customer really uh, demands a unique, a unique uh, application, we create what we call a base customer. And that's not shipped to any customer but them. So it, does it work together with the core microservice? Or is it, uh, uh, is it a branch out of your yeah. core um, to, I, I'm not the right person to answer that question. I'm, I'm, I'm mainly involved from, a, from an infrastructure standpoint and not on an application level. I, I, I know something, uh, but <laughs> not that much, to be honest. Okay, um, I see that my timer has one minute left. So, so yeah, maybe click me. One more question. Yes. Um, 
environment, do you also apply GitOps on your Git repository? Where does it, where does it get used behind? Okay. So, so everything is based on GitOps, and how do we run Git? Uh, well, it's very easily. We, it's very easy. We went to Microsoft and we bought the GitHub Enterprise license. <laughs> That's it, basically. And then how, how we actually manage Git, how we, how we manage the configuration of our GitHub? I don't know. IT does that stuff. <laughs> I de yes, delegation. I think delegation is very important in all things. <laughs> All right. Time's up. Thank you very much. If you have additional questions, feel free to visit me. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>